talk with you about software creation. And I want, I want you to, so how many of you have ever written any software before? So a number of hands. Okay, I want to demystify the process of software development and, um, and talk about how, how we create apps and, and other kinds of software. Um, if you want to prototype an idea, you want to go validate an idea, you've got this cool app that you want to do, maybe it's called Hike or something else, how do you go about testing it with people? What do you think the first step is? Any ideas? Please. Okay, now what do you mean by low fidelity prototype? Yeah, okay. So here I have a pack of 3 by 5 index cards. You could take a pack of 3 by 5 index cards and just get a little marker and you could sketch out onto the 3 by 5 cards. Here are the different screens of my app. And then you could have this little stack and you can go sit in front of a, of a potential user and say, hey, I've got this cool idea for an app and here's how it works. And you're the computer, they're the user. And when they touch one of the cards, you say, oh, okay. And then you s switch to another card in the deck and you just, it's a low fidelity prototype. What's nice about a low fidelity prototype is they're not focused on, oh, did you do a good job designing the icons and the colors and the images and all of that stuff. They're just focused on, does the thing work? Does it do what I hope it will do? And then you'll learn from that experience, oh, I want to touch here and do the following thing that you didn't even think of. And it's very cheap. It's really easy to make a change to your prototype. And so that's a great way to do a prototype. Other ways I've seen prototypes of user interfaces for websites and stuff get done. Get a big roll of butcher paper, spread it out on a big banquet table. Again, a black marker and sketch things out. Just draw some rectangles and draw some arrows that show how things are connected. Real easy. What you see on the screen here is called the storyboard for my iOS app. That's the citation index. And now this is no longer a low fidelity prototype. You're seeing the pixels being rendered on the simulator just exactly like it's going to be on the actual device. How many of you have run this app before? A few hands? Okay. Um, it's, it's been a labor of love. I really love working on this thing. The first thing I did was a website. I think I told you that before. The second thing I did was an Android app and then an iOS app. So your bishop says, hey, I'd like you to give a talk on obedience. And you say, well, I know a good obedience scripture, 1 Nephi 3.7. So you go over to 1 Nephi 3, and you drill in, and you see, oh, 95 entries for 1 Nephi 3.7. And, oh, President Eyring has used that a number of times in recent conferences. And you tap on one of these things, and it goes, and it pulls up the talk, and it highlights where that was used in the talk. And so you can pull out some quotes, and you can think about obedience. And then you can see, well, let's see, what other scriptures did he reference here? Hmm, Moroni 7.48. And I click on that little icon there, and I see all of the references to Moroni 7.48. So I can now link some other talks to this based on the scripture. The whole idea is from the scriptures, you can see how people are quoting, citing those scriptures. And we have a little library tab over here where you can go in and say, well, I'd really like to just read a general conference. And we go back to 1942. So Heber J. Grant, Personal Testimony of the Lord's Providence. You can read that. The church publishes 71 forward on their website, so we're redundant with that portion of it. But in fact, we just pull the content from LDS.org for that portion of it. Um, but anyway, this, this material from the earlier decades of conference is material that we've, we've scanned, we've proofread, we've done a lot of work. And my colleague Dick Galbraith has gone through and he has found all of the scripture citations. I don't know if there are any in this talk. I'm not seeing any. Okay, maybe not. Let's go to another one. There we go. And, and Dick has, has inserted references to the various scriptures that are being quoted here. Um, anyway, so the storyboard for that app is right here. And uh, it's a pretty complicated one compared to just sitting down with a three by five uh, card deck and, and just sketching things out. You want to see how to make an app? You want to see how easy it is to make an app? Let's do one. Let's do one. Okay. I need my do it. I need my uh, script here to make sure that I. Oh, I didn't pick it up from the printer. Uh, never mind. 
Okay, we'll just do it from memory. Okay, new, so I'm in a program called Xcode. Xcode only runs on Macintoshes. It will not run on a Windows machine. I see a lot of Apple logos glowing here and, and not glowing, but uh, so if you have an Apple, you can download Xcode for free and you can do what I'm about to show you here. Um, new project and we're going to call this Map It. If we have a Windows computer, what program? Well, uh, you could do Android development. You can go get Android Studio and do Android development. And it's similar but different. And you can also go rent a Mac in the cloud if you want for something like 20 bucks a month or some number like that. Uh, MacandCloud.net. You can go look there. Um, okay, so I want to make a new project, and let's see, whoops, I didn't mean to type map it there. Um, so here they have a bunch of templates for different types of projects. I'm going to choose the simplest one, which is we're just going to do a single view. And we'll just choose next. Here's where I type map it. And I'm going to put this, I need to choose a directory for it. I'm going to put it in my dev directory and create. Now, it's going to generate the code needed to create an app for me. There are a bunch of pieces to it, but one of the most important pieces for me is the storyboard. And the storyboard shows the user interface to my app. That's a cool user interface, isn't it? I am so awesome. Okay, so I go, I choose what kind of device I want to run on, and I hit the play button, and here we go. It's going to launch. There it is. There's my app in all of its glory. Okay, now that's not very exciting because I haven't done anything with it, but let's go make it more exciting. So let's, we know how to use Google Maps, right? And we know that we can get a URL out of our web browser and we can figure out how am I going to um, display that URL inside of a web browser in my app here. So let's put some pieces together here. Uh, these are all the widgets that are available for making up an Apple iOS app and I can put them into this app just dragging and dropping. If I want a label, I can put one over here. I can say, I'd like this to be latitude. So we're going to enter a latitude and a longitude, and then we're going to press a button, and we're going to ask it to map that latitude longitude in the web browser inside our little app here. Okay? So latitude, let's see, I need another user interface element. I need a, a text box I can type into. So there's my text box. And if you notice, there are these little blue guidelines that are telling me that Apple approves of the way I'm laying this stuff out. Uh, let's see, what else do I want to do? I want to do a button, and we're going to call that button Map It. When we tap on the button, we'll do the mapping. Now, I want a longitude as well, so I'm going to, I'm going to hold down the Option key, and I'm going to drag what I've already created here. And so that copies, longitude, and then Option, drag, and I get another text, or another, yeah, another text input field here making sure that those blue guidelines are snapping in place. And let's just do a little adjusting. Okay. And we'll put that up at the top of that one there. Okay. And now, hit the blue guideline over there. And that looks good. Now, the last thing we need is a web view. And so, um, now I can also go look at the, at the list view of all these widgets. And somewhere in here, it's going to tell me Well, here, I'll just start typing web. Right in here, I want a web view. And OK, so that's where I'll load the URL. Now, back over in my project, I forgot to do something that I wanted to do ahead of time. I need to tell it that I'm using a web view. So I need to say, hey, please load the library that's going to let me use the web stuff. OK. Good enough. Now back over to my storyboard. Okay, now if I run this, as is, I haven't really written any code. You haven't seen me type any lines of code in, have you? I've just dragged and dropped stuff. So when I run this, though, I'm going to get a user interface that sort of works. I mean, I can type latitudes and longitudes in here. And I can click that button, but it isn't really doing anything. So this is where I want to go connect the code up behind the scenes. So with this visual interface, I can, I can now say, well, there's some code behind the scenes. 
All right, and we pull up an assistant editor here, and it knows when I'm looking at this scene in my storyboard that this is the code. Now, it generated some stuff I don't really need. I'm just going to delete that. This is the code behind the scenes. When I want to have that view controller on the right-hand side, you see it says class view controller. When I want to have that view controller manage the thing on the left, I can say, you know what? There is a text input field over here. And I'm going to call that my latitude field. And there's a text input field that I'm calling my longitude field as well. So I'm giving them names, and it's creating things that are called outlets for whatever reason. It's kind of like an outlet in the wall. You plug something in there. Here we're kind of plugging into the user interface. And so I can talk to the view on the left in my storyboard through this outlet on the right in my view controller. OK, now the other thing I'm going to want is I'm going to want some action. When they click on the Map It button, I want to call some code here. And we'll call it Map It. And it's not an outlet, it's an action. And connect up. So now right here, I can write code to respond when they click. All right, now let me get out of the assistant editor. And let's go into the view controller here. Now, I need a little bit of code here. When I start typing text, oh, the, the simulator is, is hiding the keyboard. Um, I'm going to unconnect the hardware keyboard. And now you see it pops up the soft keyboard on the bottom. When I'm done typing and I click map it, I want that keyboard to go away. All right, so how do we make it go away? Well, that's pretty easy. We just go over here. Now, you have to learn a little vocabulary here. Uh, programming is not always super simple, but uh, anyway. Latitude field dot, and it's called resign first responder. Uh, why do they come up with a name like that? Oh, I don't know. But it's kind of a weird way to say hide the keyboard, please. OK, anyway, longitude field dot resign first responder. That will, and let me just run and prove it to you, that will hide the keyboard. So up it comes. I type in a latitude. Oh, whoops, I can't do it on the hardware, hardware keyboard. Anyway, now I click on map it and see the keyboard goes away this time. So it's responding to that little instruction I've given it. OK, well, there's a little bit more that I want to do. I want to go to the, to the web view, and I'd like to say, um, OK, now I need to say I'm using the web view here. Oh, and I need a reference to the web view. I need an outlet to the web view as well in order to be able to connect up the code here. So I'm going to control drag from that web view over here. And oops, if I can get it in the right spot, right there. And say web view. And now I can talk to the web view. I can say, web view dot. And I can tell it to do things. In particular, I'd like it to load a URL. So let's type load, and it does have some, it's auto-completing some possibilities here. There's, uh, there's this first one called load request. And yeah, that's really what I want to do. And we're going to build a URL request object. And the way you build a URL request object is you send it a URL. Oh, man, so we have to build a URL. And um, now, let's see, let me go to my script and just copy and paste that code. So it's real simple to get in here. OK. I should have remembered to pick up the printout. Uh, let's see. It's not in my recents list. OK. Sorry about that. Hang on a second. I will go find it. No, oh, it's not cooperating for me. OK. Let me just open it this way. OK, so my in-class examples, I have a map it script right there. And I want, OK, why are you giving me the rainbow of death? Here we go. OK, a little bit of code in here. I want that URL string right there. I went to, the, to my web browser and I said, what does a what does a, a URL look like for Google Maps? And 
What I want to put, plug in here for my latitude is I want to go to the latitude field and I want to get its text value. And I want to go to my longitude field and I want to get its text value. And that builds a string that I can then pass over here to this constructor to say, oops, right there. The string is URL string. Oh, fooey. I'm typing at an angle. Okay, now that should, that should run and load the actual URL that I type in. Okay, let's see if it works. Okay, and I want to be sure I get the right values over here. So I start typing, and I'm going to switch back to the hardware keyboard so I can type on my, on my Macintosh here. Okay, 40.250483. And longitude is going to be minus 111.65303. Map it. Whoa. Okay. And there's the BYU Marriott School of Business. All right. Now, um, there is some programmer speak in all of this, but this is a pretty, that's a lot of functionality to get for just a few minutes of work. And Xcode bundles a whole bunch of capability right here. And using this, where is it? back to the storyboard, using this palette of widgets right over here, I can drag and drop pretty complex interfaces. And as you saw in my citation index project, I can also connect multiple scenes together in my storyboard. So for example, I could have another view controller and I can just by by control dragging, I can say, I want you to show this other view controller as soon as they tap the Map It button. And when I run, this time I, as I type Map It, watch what happens. Okay, so now it just displays the second scene that I haven't put anything into yet. But it's that easy to assemble a user interface. You can put all of that stuff together pretty quick and easy. This would be a high fidelity prototype that I could then go take and show somebody, look, this is how my app kind of works. And with a little bit of help, how many have taken IS-201 already? Okay, so that's where you've done some programming, I guess. Um, anyway, with a little bit of that kind of work combined with a little bit of user interface education, you could figure out how to put together an iOS interface pretty quickly. Has anybody used any of the commercial prototyping tools for developing a software, uh, software interface? What have you used? Adobe XD, you like it? Yeah. Okay. Others? Has anybody else used a prototyping tool? Okay, there's no end to the prototyping tools out there. Envision is one that's pretty good. Um, I, I don't know all the names, but you go to our design school and they'll tell you a big long list. You can go Google it and you'll find a whole bunch of them. Uh, Lucid Software does a great one too that I've recommended in the past. Some of our BYU students did Lucid. And um, so, Lots of ways to do a high fidelity prototype without really doing any programming. Here I've shown you in Xcode where you can do some programming, but you actually don't have to do a lot of programming either for most stuff. Um, okay, so how many of you are, have actually thought about ideas you might like to develop software for? Okay, so not, not a lot of you, but some of you. Um, so, Let's see, we've got 20 minutes left. We won't take all of the 20 minutes. We'll end early, uh, much to everybody's relief. Um, we'll end early, but I want to show you a few things, and if you have more questions, I'd be happy to dialogue with the set for whom this is an interesting subject. Okay, when you talk with a team about what is the software we're going to put together, one of the things that we do quite often is we create user stories, and a user story is a representation of a feature in the user's terminology. So look what we have written up here. A user can post her resume to the website. A student can describe the main ideas of Scrum. A customer can sort the inbox by title. These are user stories because they're tasks that users might want to do written in the language of the user. When I was doing a sabbatical for Entice Labs, one of the things that we did is we managed our software process through user stories. Now let me go make this slide a little bit bigger. This is the break room in the back corner of our office. Off to this side was the soda machine and all the goodies and stuff like that. 
Over here, what you see is a little box with post-it notes and markers and things like that. And people, as, as they were thinking about what they were doing, whatever their role in the company was, doesn't matter if they were a salesperson doing business development, a developer, a software developer, a designer, um, CEO, anybody in the company could come over here, grab a post-it note and say, here's a user story that I think we ought to talk about. And then the person in charge of, of managing this, uh, we call this a backlog, a product backlog. Here are the things for us to work on. Um, the manager who was dealing with that would then take post-it notes off of this wall and put them over here somewhere. And where they would go uh, depended on the priority that was attached to that user story by the uh, product manager. So there would be those that we uh, might work on. You can't quite see the title in this photo, but these off to the right were stories that we might work on at some point in the future, but no guarantee. The, uh, right down here we saw information about the current version of the software, but then these were the stories that are coming up. They're high priority, but we're not quite ready to work on them. On the left then, here are the stories that we're working on next in the current what we would call a sprint, the current unit of development activity that we'd work on. And um, the whole idea of a user story is it captures something that's easy for the user to understand, it's gonna add real value, and then what it does, it reminds the developer, okay, when you are ready to work on this, here's a person you need to go talk to and go learn more about what they really mean by this user story. Make sure you've nailed down what they wanna do, and then you work on it. This is really key to lean software development. How many of you have read enough to know what lean startup is now? You feel like you have a pretty good handle on it? Uh, could somebody give me kind of a concise description of the lean approach to a startup? Okay, so it's an iterative process of development. You don't start by saying, hey, let's take a year and let's design our product and then we'll bring in a developer team and they'll program it and then we'll bring in a testing team and they'll test it and then we'll ship it to our customers. What you do is you ship along the way and as much as possible. And it doesn't matter whether it's software or a, or a physical product. You try to follow that process and get the customer involved as soon as possible. User stories let that happen. You can start with some core features, and then um, the next screen, I'll just show it to you. I won't really explain all of this stuff, but all of these little loops are cycles that your team is going through as you're developing software. And you're continually getting feedback and you're adjusting. And it's super important to be agile in your approach and not assume you know everything, but be ready to adjust as soon as the user tells you, the customer tells you that they want something different. Um, the lean approach, you've seen the business model canvas, do you all know the business model canvas? Seen a lot of heads nodding yes? Okay, hang on, let me just, let's pull up Safari real quick. Okay, and I'm going to say business model canvas. Okay, so there's, a, there's an example of the business model canvas. And everything you write on this canvas is an assumption. And every assumption needs to be tested. And the right-hand side is what we call the front end of the business model. And the left-hand side is what we call the back end of the business model. And um, so the first thing, you start with value propositions, which is this middle column. And then you write your customer segments, which is the right-hand column. And then you figure out how you're going to connect the value propositions to the customer segments. And um, testing everything you've written on the canvas is the lean approach to startups. Every time you make a change to your canvas, that is a pivot in your business model. And a, a, have you heard the term pivot being used in startups? Okay. Every change to that canvas is a pivot because you've learned something and you're making an adjustment. Okay. Well, if you're doing your software process right, you'll start by saying, I think this is the core idea, and here's the customer segment, and then you'll start to work through that with whatever kinds of prototypes you want. 
And then as you gather user stories with your post-it notes or whatever else, uh, you know, sometimes I use a spreadsheet, an Excel spreadsheet or a Google sheet to track the user stories in a project. And you talk with your actual customers as you develop those out. Um, okay, well, I don't know if I've convinced you that it's easy to do a prototype, but you can actually get a pretty functional app prototype. Oh, and by the way, I could run this, where was it? Sorry, this one. I could run this MapIt project right on my phone. I just need to plug my phone into the computer and it'll install there. And I can go actually take a real app and show it to my customers and say, do you like the way this works? Should we refine it? And um, so it's, it's pretty quick and easy. All right, um, we'll take off now. If there are those who would like to spend some more time asking questions or talking about software development, I'll stick around for as long as you'd like to be here. There will not be a Q&A up in, the, in 710 afterwards, sorry. But uh, thank you for your attention. And next week, we'll hear from Linda Klug, who has a cool new startup. She's out of Park City. Um, and uh, let's see, I forget the name of the startup. Um, anyway, it's a cool new startup. And I think you'll really enjoy listening to Linda. Yeah, it'll be an easy one. Okay, thanks for being here.